have one more outside speaker from uh, outside of the Jane community. This is Kim Sterla. She's the executive director of Animal Place, which is a sanctuary here close by, which she co-founded in 1989. She's been a central figure in the animal rights movement for over 30 years. Um, she actually wrote the first law in the country that protects pre-university students um, unwilling to participate in animal dissections, which I thought was really interesting. I didn't, I didn't even know about that. And for more than a decade, she served as the director of the Peninsula Humane Society. Please welcome Kim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I so much appreciate being invited to come and speak at the Jane Center. I first met Gina. We were doing a day of mindfulness out of the sanctuary at Animal Place. Um, we had John Salerno White, who's um, under the Thich Nhat Hans in Buddhism tradition, and it was a day of mindfulness that was beautiful, and that was when I first met you, and, and again, thank you. I um, co-founded and now direct Animal Place, and we are a sanctuary for farm animals. So those are the animals that people typically see as a food source. Try down animal. I want to start by introducing you to some of the animals that we rescued. Uh, right here is Summer and Freedom, two little Jersey calves. Those are two calves that I actually personally bought at an auction yard. We don't generally buy animals, rarely. I went to an auction yard up in Petaluma. I wanted to do an article on auctions for our newsletter, and those two little guys uh, one for $2 and one for $5. They're so cheap because they're considered trash. Your male dairy calves essentially have no monetary value to the farmer. One, I thought for sure we would have to take be euthanized. I drove them right to UC Davis immediately, but they fortunately were able to save us life. Their summer in freedom right before we got them. There's Bruce. Looks like a very happy pig taking a mud bath, as pigs love doing on hot summer days. Bruce was a local cruelty case. Somebody called me, concerned that that pig was starving, had no shelter. He was about 300 pounds underweight when we rescued him. Fat and sassy there, you can see. Laura and Charlene. Laura, the one with the horns, those two are obviously best buddies, as I think that, that picture shows you well. Laura was rescued from an auction yard by actually Laura Moretti, who used to write for Animals Voice and Animals Agenda. Laura had a broken front leg. They had a rope around her. They were dragging her. Laura Moretti intervened and saved her. Jude. Jude has a real interesting history. Two years ago, big poultry farm up in Petaluma. Turkeys. They all got collected, transported to the slaughterhouse because they're going to be on Thanksgiving tables. But amazingly, miraculously, one turkey in the shed who they did not catch. A neighbor saw, called us, we drove and got Jude. This is Sadie. Sadie has probably one of the saddest histories of all the animals we have rescued. She is a Holstein, again, a dairy cow. Dairy calves, females are raised so that they can produce milk, so we can impregnate them, so we can take away their babies, so we can have their milk, their milk that that cow produced for her babies. She's a mammal like all of us. And we only produce milk after we're pregnant and we give birth. And we produce milk only to feed our baby. But you know what? Sadie gave birth to seven babies. She was pregnant for nine months each time. And each time her baby was taken from her instantaneously, because we wanted Sadie's milk. Afterwards, she was sold at auction. University bought her to use her as a teaching tool, which they did for seven months. And then she was going to go back to auction, where she would have been slaughtered. 
but a veterinary student intervened and we got Sadie. But we got Sadie in such bad condition. And surprisingly, she was pregnant. The university bought her at auction not knowing she was pregnant. She went through labor, her water broke when she was at the sanctuary. We brought a vet out and he pulled out her dead calf. We kept that calf with Sadie for a few hours. She just groomed him the whole time. It's the only time she's been able to have any kind of maternal um, experience. And what a sad experience it was. But fortunately, Sadie lived many, many years of animal place. So at least the end of her life was pretty good. Carmen. Carmen, as you can see, is missing a front leg. She was a little baby, a local cruelty case up in Grass Valley where we're located. Um, people didn't do anything. Finally, neighbors intervened. We got custody of Carmen, took her to Davis. Two surgeries, hospitalization a week later, they couldn't save the leg, but Carmen is still doing fine. And then the last one here that I wanna introduce to you. This is a little girl from the Turlock Rescue. Big egg farm in Turlock, California, the Central Valley, 50,000 hens left to starve to death. Two and a half weeks, they had water, no food. 20,000 died. The others were there when state departments were trying to, they were gassing them in mass, but we were able to save 4,360. So Animal Place, we've got two shelters. We have 600 acres up in Grass Valley this year, Foothills, that's where our headquarters are. And that's where we're open for farm tours, for visitors, we do educations, we do retreats. We do Thank the Turkey events, which we have happening in November 22nd. Will Tuttle will be speaking, we'll have a vegan, gourmet, turkey-less dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. And then we also make wonderful, delicious, little individual yam pies that all the visitors get to enjoy hand feeding the turkeys. It's a celebration for us to thank the turkeys. Then we also have a sanctuary in Vacaville, which is fairly close to you guys, and Vacaville operates a really unique program we have. It's called Rescue Ranch, and the whole purpose of that program is to rescue animals from farms and put them up for adoptions. We've had that program in existence for three and a half years, and during that time, I am so proud to tell you, we have saved over 16,000 animals. Most of those are spent hens. Vast majority are spent hens. And how that program operates is that we call the farmers repeatedly, all the farms on the West Coast, and ask them when they're ready to depopulate, as the previous speakers were explaining, and I think Jack, Jack was explaining to you, is that chickens raise for their eggs that they're slaughtered at a year and a half, or they're gassed because their egg production starts decreasing to a point when it's just not in the farmer's financial interest to keep her alive. So at the point when they're depopulating, that's when we ask if we can go in and pull those birds out. Logistically, it's kind of an amazing uh, process. When we call a farm and they can say, yes, you can take 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 birds, logistically how that is, um, is worked out is pretty amazing. We put together teams of people, we rent the vans, we prep the vans, we load them with poultry crates, we go to the site, which is usually a distance away, we have to handle the lodging, we get to the farms by dawn because it's cool, we want to pull those birds out. They're petrified because understand all those birds are in cages with a floor space maybe a little bit bigger than this laptop. And there's anywhere from four, six, eight, sometimes 10 birds per cage. That's all they've done is to be squished in a cage like this with their feet on wire. And we pull them out and they're petrified. They're screaming, their little feet are hanging onto the cage. But we get them, we put them in crates, we transport them back to the sanctuary and then the joyful time, the one incredible joyful time, is when you open up those crates and they put their head out and they actually jump out. 
They're not standing on wire anymore. They're standing on earth. We have small yards. They go outside. You know what? They feel sunshine on their backs. They can take a dust bath. They can sunbathe. That's all typical chicken behavior. They've never experienced any of it. Everything is first for them. There's a bunch of chickens who have rescued who have just started going outside. There is a rehabilitation process with these girls. And it takes about a month. And during that first month with us, we do all the health checks. We do the parasite control. Um, you know, all the trimming the nails because they're all long and overgrown. But they also need to, to learn to use their muscles and their wings. All their muscles have atrophied because they're just standing like this in a cage. Literally, they can't even move their wings out. Literally. They don't have the strength. They wouldn't have the strength to jump up on, on top of one of the chairs, let alone the tabletop. So it is a slow, slow process. Aside from the rescue that we do, a program which is very dear to my heart is Food for Thought, and that program is reaching out to humane societies, rescue groups, and asking them to adopt a vegan-friendly menu. If not vegan, at least vegetarian. It doesn't make sense as we try explaining to fry cows on the grill or to have cheese while they're trying to raise animals to help dogs or cats. That dogs and cats have no moral, extreme moral worth or value than a pig, than a chicken, a cow, a goat, or a sheep. Similarly, I co-founded and I'm on the board of Dharma Voices for Animals. And that group is doing something very similar, but with our Buddhist groups, with sanghas, with retreat centers, with monasteries, reaching out to them and asking them to extend that circle of compassion for all species, human and non-human. And interestingly, you know, the two big issues that I think all of you that work on this issue, like Jack and Anne, it's the dairy and it's the eggs. If you want to look at that cruelty index of how much suffering goes into providing an animal-based food diet, Usually, hamburger is the first thing people give up eating, and cheese is the last. It should be the reverse. Far more cruelty goes in to the production of that little cream in your coffee, or the slice of cheese, or your omelet. That really went into a hamburger, or a slice of ham. Mastitis. Chickens raised for their eggs, which are already covered. No, no space do they have. All chickens raised for eggs in California, they're either trucked, sent to slaughter, or they're gassed. Chickens, they want to be free. They want to take sun baths. They want to take dust baths. They want to go into their nest box to lay their eggs. They want to hang out with other hens. They have the ability to recognize 100 other hens and keep that memory in the brain. Their vocalization is very sophisticated. They're not stupid animals as sometimes they're played out to be. And dairies. Dairy cows are in dry lots like these. As with chickens raised for their eggs, the males, little chicks, they're immediately killed. They're ground up alive in large macerating machines, and then the females are de-beaked. And in the dairy, yeah, the male cows aren't going to give milk, so what are you going to do with them? They're typically not of the type of breed that is good, quote unquote, eating meat. So all the calves are like summer in freedom. The two little calves I showed you at the beginning of the slideshow. They're, hot, they're taken from their mom hours, if not minutes after birth, and go to auction. Grooming is one of the most important um, behaviors that cows have. That's how they connect with one another. This was wonderful, wonderful Sadie grooming Nicholas. Not her baby, obviously, but when we rescued Nicholas, another little cat that came to our sanctuary, Sadie just took him under her wing. And literally, he would stand there for five minutes at a time while she just licked him 
and lick them. So my message for all of you is, is thank you for what you do. I would like to kind of echo what Anne was saying. Put your compassion into action. It doesn't mean one iota for the animals. If you feel bad how those dairy calves are kept and treated, if you're still eating cheese. It wouldn't have helped Bruce, that pig that was 300 pounds underweight, that a woman who felt so bad how he was treated didn't act on that compassion and call me so I could do something to help. Caring isn't enough. You have to put that compassion and that passion you have inside into action to help those who do not have the ability to do so themselves. Thank you.